in recent years, we have heard a shocking amount of cases where women or men will hire a hitman to murder their partner, whether it be for money or custody of their child or simply because they don't want to be with them anymore. Those cases are always so tragic and unnecessary. However, with today's case, the way these events unfolded is just wild and ended up being so much more horrific than even those responsible could have expected. But before we get into this wild ride of a case, I want to say a huge thank you to Nurex for partnering with me on today's video. Nurex is a digital healthcare platform that makes it easy to get the expert healthcare that you deserve at every step in your healthcare journey. You can work with Nurex licensed medical providers to tackle all sorts of skin concerns like acne breakouts, dark spots, hyperpigmentation, or smoothing out fine lines and wrinkles. They have over 50 clinically proven dermatologist treatments for all sorts of skin concerns that will work much more effectively and efficiently than over-the-counter products. But beyond that, the best part for me is that Nurex meets you where you're at. You can skip the in-person appointment and do a medical consultation anytime that fits your busy schedule. You just share your skin history with a few photos and a Nurex provider licensed in your state will review your medical history and if appropriate, they will prescribe treatment for you. Then they will stay with you all throughout your journey. Nurex's team of dermatology experts will guide you through every step of the way. With Nurex, patients get a personalized treatment plan and a full year of unlimited messaging with Nurex dermatology expert providers and their care team. So they do truly check every box when it comes to personalized expert care. Taking control of your health starts here. Head to the link in the description box below to get started today. Results may vary and this is not offered in every state. Medications are prescribed only if clinically appropriate and consultation is required. Thank you again so much to Nurex for partnering with me on today's video. With that being said, let's get into the case. Today, we are going to be discussing the deaths of Michael Caposuina and Glenn Cassidy. 35-year-old Michael Caposuina was living in the town of West Meadows, Australia when he met 26-year-old Bianca Edmonds in early 2012. Bianca was born to parents Ross and Ellen Smith, and she was the second oldest of four children with two brothers and one sister. Growing up, Bianca's father was absent from the home for extended periods of time due to his job in the mining industry. At some point in her childhood, Bianca's parents split up and her mother would remarry a man named Bevan Edmonds. When she was young, she was adopted by her stepfather, thus changing her last name to his. For most of her childhood, Bianca did not have any sort of relationship with her father, but the two would later reconnect and develop a close bond. After high school, Bianca joined the Royal Australian Navy where she was trained in logistics but she was discharged after only a year of service due to stress fractures that she suffered to her feet. After that, she jumped from job to job. By 2007, she had her first son named Tyler with a man named Dirk. I'm not sure of the custody situation with Tyler, whether she had full custody of him or if he was in the care of his father, but I do believe that Tyler was in her care at least part of the time, if not full time. Either way, as Bianca grew into an adult, her family described her as being confident and self-assured. She knew what she wanted out of life and she would do whatever it took to get it. And those are some of the qualities that drew Michael Caposuina to her. The two started a relationship and quickly became engaged. That same year, Bianca also found herself pregnant and by June 3rd, 2013, they welcomed their baby, a son who they named Luca, into the world. However, as their relationship progressed, Michael and Bianca realized that their relationship just was not going to work. They were fighting all the time and by all accounts, their relationship grew very toxic. So, they broke off the engagement and went their separate ways. Shortly after the breakup between Michael and Bianca, she started a new relationship with a new man. Sometime in early 2015, Bianca met 48-year-old Glenn Cassidy, who was almost 20 years older than her, on the dating app Tinder, and soon after, the two started a relationship. Glenn had previously been married for 20 years before he met Bianca, and he had two daughters from his previous marriage. So, it seems like they were in similar situations, which helped them develop a close bond. 
After Glenn started this relationship with Bianca, things moved very quickly. They began discussing marriage only months into their relationship, and by February of 2016, the two were married. However, while enjoying the start of this new chapter in her life with Glenn, Bianca was still dealing with a lot of drama and fighting with her ex, Michael. Now, for the first months of Luca's life, Michael didn't have much involvement with raising or even seeing his son. But in February of 2013, so going back just a little bit, Michael started a new relationship with a woman named Selvana, and around that time, it seems like Michael found some stability and was in a pretty good spot in his life. So by the time Luca was nine months old in March of 2014, Michael started to request visitation with his son. This started some very tumultuous court battles between the two. Bianca did not want Michael involved in her son's life. She started making different accusations against Michael, who she said was abusive and toxic and unfit to be a father. I will get more into that in just a minute. But after some court hearings, by August of 2015, Michael was granted supervised visits with Luca at a family support organization. That way, he could have his time with Luca in a neutral location. For these court-ordered visits, Michael was allowed one two-hour visit with Luca every two weeks. These visits were taking place in Melbourne, which was almost a two-and-a-half-hour drive from where she was living with Glenn in Shepparton. This was just a massive inconvenience for Bianca, and she didn't want to deal with it. Then, after several visits with Luca, Michael took to court once again, this time asking for more unsupervised time with him. Of course, this also enraged Bianca. While all of this was going on with the court battles and fighting and arguing between Michael and Bianca, of course, their respective partners, Silvana and Glenn, were being told two different sides of the story. Of course, Michael would tell Silvana about how toxic Brianna was and how all he wanted to do was see his son. Of course, she took his side. Meanwhile, Bianca was telling Glenn how abusive Michael had been towards her, how he was going to try to kidnap Luca and remove him from Australia. By all accounts, Glenn had treated Luca as his own and was an amazing partner and a good influence on Luca. So she would tell Glenn that he was the only man she wanted in her son's life, that Michael was not good enough for him. She would constantly tell Glenn that she wishes Michael would just stop trying to see Luca and that things would be so much easier if he wasn't in their lives. All of this, of course, caused Glenn to have great disdain against Michael. It turned out, though, that throughout the years of her relationship with Glenn, Bianca wasn't just complaining about Michael because she was frustrated and upset with the situation. She was purposely trying to make Michael out to look like the worst, most dangerous person who Glenn needed to protect his family from. By December in 2015, things got more intense. Bianca started using sex as a way to manipulate Glenn and get him to do her bidding. For instance, she would refuse to have sex with Glenn unless he went along with her wanting to kill Michael. When she did have sex with him, she refused to let him finish until he agreed to kill Michael for her. But at this time, it was sort of just a fantasy that turned her on and, you know, she just wanted him to say that he would kill Michael for her. But it got to the point where Bianca started to degrade Glenn, calling him demeaning names and saying things like, if you were a real man, you'd take care of it. You'd sort it out. You're a spineless coward. You're piss weak. Or she would threaten to leave him if she didn't kill Michael. She would say, you're the man, you're the leader of this family. It's your job to protect us against him. At first, again, killing Michael was not something that Glenn would have ever even considered doing for Bianca. It was sort of just something that they said. But as time went on and she continued to complain about just how bad of a person Michael was, and now she was using her body against him, saying these awful demeaning things, Glenn started to get more serious about the idea of actually killing Michael. So, it was around this time that a plan started to formulate. First, Glenn came up with a list of everything he needed to do and wanted to do before and after murdering Michael. I will note this list is very poorly spelled, which you'll notice in just a minute, 
but he writes out that the obstacles to murdering Michael include only having one bullet, getting him alone, what to do with his body, and how to transport the body. He wrote things that he wanted to do before the job, including leaving financial support for Bianca and the kids, and have at least one baby with Bianca, or at least her be pregnant. He also wanted to have as much sex as possible. I will note that around this time, Bianca and Glenn were trying to get pregnant. They were trying IVF treatments, but at the time, nothing was working and Glenn was not able to get Bianca pregnant at this time. On the list, he wrote more about the plans and steps for committing the job. He wrote, Road of a Mornings, which I'm not sure what that quite means, but maybe it's saying that it needs to be committed in the morning. I'm not exactly sure. But he went on to write, knife, waters, biker car, that's not mine, no plate. The last thing on the list was jobs for Ha, which again, I'm not sure exactly what that means. Again, as you can see, Glenn is not the best speller, being described as almost illiterate. However, when it comes to spelling, I can't blame him because I also can't spell for shit. But remember this fact because it will come back later in the video. Either way, the next part of the plan was to get comfortable with where Michael lived. Together, Glenn and Bianca drew out a map of the neighborhood where Michael lived, as well as a detailed diagram of the home, including where the front door was, where he should enter, where the street lights were, and where the dog would be barking. By March of 2016, the plan was in full swing. They decided on a few different dates, but each time they planned to carry out the job, something would get in the way. Glenn had driven from his home in Shepperton to West Meadows to scope out Michael's place on several different occasions. During these visits, he would call Bianca where he spoke about the different concerns he had, including when it should occur and how he should do it. He complained multiple times about Michael not being home at a good time, saying that he was always out. In these calls, they referred to the murder plot as the job or work. When he says that he's at his workplace, he's referring to the home as he's staking the place out. In one call, when he says, I'm at work alone, he means that he went to Michael's to try and possibly carry out the job, but they weren't home at a convenient time. No one showed up. Um, and not a sight of anyone, shame. so I'm here with work by myself. That's a shame. Yeah. Not even at oh. the other place. Well, maybe Saturday night, maybe everyone had a different change of plans and they'll be home later. Yeah, that's why I'm hanging around the later. I'll hang around till about 11 o'clock. After dark, usually people head home. Yeah, well, it's dark now. Yeah, well, it's not here. I'm an hour and a half different. I forgot yeah. about that. I'll hang around till about 11, 12 o'clock, and if no one showed up by then, I'm just going to call it quits for the night. Yeah, get your sleep. Play some sport tomorrow or something. Yeah. Do what you need to do. Yeah. Yeah, I'll try. Uh, Fresh you makes the calm me. <laughs> I just uh, can't sleep when you're not here. I know, but I had weird feelings last night. Like, I felt anxious yeah, knowing that you, had, you haven't been sleeping too. Uh, yeah, look, that's part. Like, the dog and everything just last night did not feel, feel right from the start. So, it's probably lucky that, they, that no one showed up. Yeah, well, you got to sleep. So, I feel much better, okay? Yeah. And tell me how much you've slept afterwards so I'm not all, you know, because mm -mm, you're operating heavy machinery, so. Yeah. Right, I guess. Oh, well, just get it done then. That way we don't have to worry about it anymore. Yeah. Yeah, just one night like this. Hey? Just go to work. That way it's over and done with and we don't have any more nights like this. Yeah. It's getting to everyone, I think. Yeah, it is. <laughs> I, I am completely over this job. I'm over it. It's got to be. Well, just finish it. <laughs> I'm trying. And then concentrate on the next. You know, you can concentrate going to more applying for jobs and maybe Billabong or I don't know. Yeah. Finish this job and move on. <sighs> just let the future be better. Yeah. Yeah. We need we need less stress in our life, and I'm not looking forward to having to go to legal aid and get it all. Fixed yeah, we still have to do all that. I know, but I'm sick of the. You know, I don't want to have to. The rest of my life is going to be like that. Mm. 
that everything okay? I'm really disappointed. I was hoping you got work. Yeah, me too. I need it. I'm sorry. Can't do what I can't do. I know. Mm. All right, I'll talk to you later on. Yeah, okay. Just heading out the door, so. Right, eh? Give us a ring later and I'll pull over. No worries. Okay, love you, All right, drive carefully, please. I will, I love you. I love you, too. We also hear in these calls how Glenn is desperately searching for any sign of affection from Bianca, which she rarely gives. At times, she even sounds annoyed at his pleas for affection. He tells her he loves her, and she says, I know. Then, in another call from March 3rd, we hear Glenn asking her if they can have sex tomorrow. And she responds by saying maybe if they have something to celebrate. And Glenn says that he's trying his hardest. You know what? I've never, ever loved someone like I love her. And she goes, oh, that's sweet. That's a bit of truth. And it is. When I'm away from you, I hurt. I bet you look beautiful. Hmm? I bet you look beautiful. Hello. I bet you look beautiful. Yeah. Both times I couldn't hear that last one. Yeah. Oh, you want to hear me drink my coffee? Huh? You want to hear me? speak up. Uh, I don't want to wake Luca. So everyone's oh. whispering. I hope this is going better tonight. I hope there's someone there. Well, it's Sunday. They probably went away. Yeah. Friggin' annoying, but I feel like waste time. <laughs> yeah. I feel like you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Well. But you gotta do what you gotta do. I know. Hi, Kadoo. I want to celebrate. I bought you a present. I want to celebrate too. Friggin' trust me. <laughs> but, um, yeah. So. Oh, well, cross my fingers and I'll try my hardest, you know that. Um, yeah. So there's no um, no work obligations down here and everything shipped up. Mm. Yeah, trust me, it's... Oh, yeah. Just don't get all funny after the job. No. Yeah, don't hurt yourself. No, that won't happen. I mean, I know it's a pretty mental job that you're doing, but physically and mentally and all that don't hurt yourself no it's still be right yeah I love you I know yeah no worries yeah. think can we have sex tomorrow night I don't know it depends if we're celebrating or not oh <laughs> see bye <laughs> I love you enjoy your job yeah I love you concentrate I love you Concentrate, don't stuff up, pay attention. Yeah, I will. I love you. I know. Okay. See you, bye. For some unknown reason, Glenn actually downloaded an app on his phone to record all of the phone calls so we can hear some of the conversations they had when they were plotting this whole thing out. In the meantime, Bianca had taken a vacation with Glenn's mother to Darwin, Australia, which is completely on the other side of Australia. It was thought that maybe the plan was supposed to take place during this time to give Bianca an alibi, but that isn't what ended up happening. Bianca was in Shepparton by March 11th, 2016. But when she got home from her vacation, she urged Glenn saying what needed to be done. And this is when the job was actually set in motion. But what ended up actually happening was beyond what anybody could have prepared for or expected even Bianca. By Saturday, March 12th, 2016, at 12.23 p.m., Bianca received a text from Glenn's phone saying, quote, Bianca, I love you so much. You have no idea what I'm about to do. Something that you would consider absolutely effing stupid, but I can't put up with this shit anymore. I can't be a part-time parent to Luca. If I get caught, I want them to know that you had nothing to do with this. This is my choice, my decision. You know nothing about it, please. I could see the stress of you losing our first baby due to him and I could never forgive him for that and it scared me that one day he would try to take my boy from me. He pushed me over the effing edge. Please know that what I do, I do for you. 
even though you wouldn't agree. I love you so much. To this, Bianca responded, don't be so bloody stupid, Glenn. You marry me knowing Luca will be seeing him even though it's upsetting us all here. Don't you dare try to manipulate me into feeling sorry for you by saying such idiotic things. I will not tolerate being yelled at. Enjoy your drive and take your effing time. I'm over it. She texted him again a bit later saying, Glenn, enough come home. During this text exchange, location data would later confirm that both Bianca and Glenn were at home in Shepperton. It wasn't until around 1 p.m. that day that Glenn left Shepperton in his blue sedan and got onto Hume Highway and headed towards the Melbourne area. His vehicle was captured on CCTV footage several times over the next few hours heading in that direction. As this was happening, Michael and Silvana had been enjoying each other's company, getting dinner together before returning home by 7 p.m. After dinner, the two sat down to watch a movie together, but after they arrived home, CCTV footage caught Glenn parking on the street parallel to the street in which Michael's home was located. According to later testimony, by 7.18 p.m., Silvana actually saw Glenn get out of his car and walk down the street empty-handed. She told Michael what she saw, but honestly, he found it a little bit hard to believe. Bianca and Glenn didn't live anywhere nearby, and there was no reason for either of them to be in that area. But it was confirmed because CCTV captured Glenn walking past their home at that time empty-handed. Then, by 727, CCTV saw him walking by the house again, this time carrying a big white bag. By 7.30 p.m., Glenn finally walked up to the front door. Of course, this concerned both Silvana and Michael. They saw him at the door, and they were very confused as to why he would just randomly show up. So, Michael went to the kitchen to grab a knife just in case anything went wrong. Glenn knocked on the door and Michael opened it, but he left the security door shut while they had a conversation. For those of you who don't know, a security door is basically a door with like a metal mesh window so that you can talk to the person on the other side, but they aren't able to make entry into the home. Silvana decided not to come to the door while the men spoke, but she did hear Michael tell Glenn, I can't help you with that. So, Glenn extended his hand to get Michael to do a handshake. Unfortunately, this did work, and Michael opened the door for a handshake. It was at that time that Glenn forced his way inside, causing a struggle to ensue between the two men. During the struggle, Glenn managed to get his gun, a sawed-down shotgun, and pointed it at Michael's head. Meanwhile, Michael defended himself by brandishing his knife and stabbing Glenn several times in the torso. This wasn't enough to stop Glenn, however, because he was able to pull the trigger, and he shot Michael one time in the head, killing him. As that was happening, Silvana watched in absolute horror. The whole chaos of the situation left Glenn thinking that Silvana was actually the one who stabbed him, so he turned the gun to her, attempting to shoot her, but as we know from earlier, the gun only had one bullet inside and it had just been used to kill Michael. So he ended up bashing Silvana over the head with the gun, attempting to take her life as well. But shortly after, he too collapsed onto the ground due to numerous stab wounds that he had suffered after Michael had defended himself. By 7.32 p.m., Triple Zero received a call from a terrified Silvana who described that she had just been attacked and her boyfriend had been shot. When police arrived to the home, they entered into a very confusing scene. Silvana described to first responders how a man knocked on their door, prompting Michael to grab a knife just in case. The man then forced his way into the home, carrying a sawed-off shotgun before an altercation broke out, resulting in Michael being shot, Silvana being attacked, and Glenn being stabbed. At first, investigators really didn't know what to make of the whole situation. They just knew that there were two men who got into an altercation who attacked each other and ended up dead. They even looked into Silvana at one point since she was present at the scene and could have possibly been the one who murdered them. But as they investigated, they realized that there was much, much more to the story than what initially met the eye. 
The first clue that they started to investigate was that blue sedan that Glenn had driven as well as his own cell phone. They found many of the things that we've discussed up to this point, including the recorded phone calls, the texts between Glenn and Bianca, as well as that CCTV footage that shows Glenn staking out Michael's house multiple times, including on the day of the murder. It actually took police months to connect Bianca to the murder, and for those months, I'm sure she felt like she just got away with everything. But by December of 2016, she was arrested and taken in for her first interview with police. In that interview, Bianca was in tears, hysterical, acting like this was all Glenn's doing. She said that Glenn was upset that he was only a part-time parent to Luca. He wanted more time and wanted the weekends all to himself. She was the one who was trying to mitigate things, trying to make things as fair as possible for both Luca and Glenn. She denied ever saying that she wanted Michael dead, going as far as saying, I'm not a psycho. She pondered that maybe Glenn just cracked under the pressure of dealing with his own kids and his own ex, and then put Michael on top of all of that, it was no wonder he lashed out. The next thing police brought up were the text messages they found between Glenn and Bianca on the afternoon of the murder. I read it to you earlier, where Glenn apparently sent this well-written paragraph about how he's so tired of dealing with Michael and how he needs to do something about it, about how he doesn't want Bianca to be blamed, that it's all his doing, and that she knows nothing about it. Bianca then calls him stupid, saying not to do anything to Michael. Now, as I stated earlier, and as we all clearly saw in the notes app, Glenn cannot spell even very basic words. Yet, in the text messages, there are little to no spelling errors. So, investigators were confident that Bianca probably sent this text to herself. It didn't sound like something that Glenn would say anyways, saying, I'm about to do this, you don't know about it, just so you know, you don't know, I'm gonna do it, but you don't know about it, just so you know. It doesn't make any sense for the text to have been written that way, so again, police believed that Bianca did it. She denied it, but it did make absolute sense based on how well written the text was and just based on the content of the text. What would he possibly have to gain, personally? What would he have to gain? He would have gone to jail. Correct. He would have lost us as well. Correct. So what? He wanted us. He hated being a part-time. He called himself a part-time parent to Luca, yet I'm the one that fought so hard to make it so he was okay. One weekend a month we were looking at for okay. him to have him during the day and it had to be up at Shepherd and where we were. So I'm the one that tried to make things as easy as possible for people because he wanted a long time. He wanted weekends already in Melbourne as yep. well. I was the one that went to court heaps negotiating everything to the point where we were both almost happy with the result. Did you ever say in front of Glenn <coughs> that you wish Michael would, uh, was dead? And no, I've never wished anyone dead. Really? I wish people would just F off and we were going to hopefully go to Darwin and just, just try and, you know, live normal. So you've never indicated to Glenn that you wish Michael was dead? I doubt it. Well, because I'm not a psycho. What is going through Glenn's mind is you know, really important for us to try and understand why this incident has unfolded, why it's happened in the first place. So you know, if we can piece together what he's doing, you know, particularly just prior to the incident, then it might um, shed some light on why it happened. Um, so, my what? parents have spoken to me about this. They're like, maybe he got pushed, pushed to his limits. Mm. Everything with his girls and his ex and yeah. Michael and work and his mum being sick and him being sick with his cancer and I think, just, I think everything just, I don't know. Yeah. He had enough. I don't know. But in terms of his actual. Ability to read and write properly wasn't that? Mm -hmm. How would you describe it? Is it? He avoided it. Okay. 
Because yeah. you felt a bit uncomfortable. He avoided it at yeah. all costs. So my question, did you type no, that text message? I did not type that message. So you denied that you sent that text message from Glenn's yeah. phone? Okay. I did not type it. Okay. Oh, I'm, ask, I'm just asking you, you can either agree with it or disagree with it. I did not type okay. it. I did not type okay. it. That's all I'm asking you. And you can respond how you choose or not at all. And I know you spelled Luca's name wrong. Yes. So you uh, you deny sending that text message? Yes. Uh, you uh, you say that you've never purchased a, a firearm? I've never bought a firearm. Okay. okay. You've never shown anybody a firearm no. firearm in the no. lead up to this? No. Okay. Have you ever asked anyone to kill Michael for you? No. Okay. You sure about that? Yes. Okay. It's just absurd. Well, again, it's just oh, a question God, for you. Sick. It's a question for you. You can either accept it or reject it. It's as simple as that. It's all this process is about, okay? But still, at the time, police didn't yet feel like they had enough to make any actual charges against Bianca. So, after this first interview, they released Bianca without any charges. As police continued with their investigation, Bianca's dating life did not slow down. She went right back to Tinder looking for more men to date and hook up with. And only three weeks after Glenn's death, she found her new man. This was a man named Todd Bookham. Todd was a former inmate who was on parole when he met Bianca. He too had a history of violence. He actually did eight years in prison after he cut his then wife's throat and stabbed her all in front of his sister-in-law and the woman's six-year-old son. So, I guess he's the perfect match for Bianca. After meeting and starting this relationship, Bianca told Todd that her last husband had died of cancer. And after only a few weeks of dating, Bianca and Todd were trying to have a baby together. Early on, she did actually get pregnant, but unfortunately, they lost the baby due to an uptopic pregnancy. But after a few months of dating, Todd found information online about Glenn and Michael and confronted Bianca with this shocking information. Apparently, according to Todd, she admitted that she plotted the murder of her ex, but it all went wrong. Glenn was never supposed to die. She told Todd that she felt if she had told him about it when they first met, she knew they would never have gotten together and she needed a father figure for her children. She allegedly told Todd that she was worried about investigators searching her home. She was worried that they knew she had written the text from Glenn's phone, basically allegedly admitting that she did write it. She was worried that they knew she provided a map drawing of Michael's house. She said that it's her fault that Glenn is dead and that he wasn't supposed to die in all of this. She just wanted to kill Michael because she was afraid that he was going to get custody of her then two-year-old son. When she was apparently admitting all of this, she was hysterical, saying that she had had enough of all of this. She said that the police are harassing her and at this point, she just wanted to turn herself in. After hearing all of this, Todd went to the police with his concerns, telling them everything she had just told him. So, by April of 2018, police took Bianca in for another interview. In this interview, she continued to deny everything. She said that she didn't write the text message. She said that she had never seen the map drawing until they showed her. They said that they found her DNA and prints on the gun, which she said didn't matter. She denied having a plan and denied that she was having any custody issues with Michael at that time. What was the opinion that you drafted that text message? I did not write that. Oh, I'm just I did that. That's fine. But if that's something that I did mm -hmm. not write that message. Um, we spoke about the map. Yes, and I have not seen that map okay, before you showed that. me that day. Your fingerprints have been found on that map. Well, I bought paper. It's probably from anywhere in the house. Okay. A single sheet of paper. We have paper, loose paper everywhere, the kids draw on them. Loose piece, papers everywhere. Okay. I did not see that map before you showed me. Okay. Uh, we have got your, your DNA. It's on a gun. Yeah, but you told me that it could be any reason because it's on Glenn. Um, I've also taken a statement from a man 
while I'm with Todd Bookham, mm -hmm. who you previously lived with. Yes. Um, and he tells us uh, a story of a conversation he has with you after you were released. My sister was there all day. Did you have a conversation with Todd regarding the plan to kill Michael? My plan? No, I don't have a plan. I don't have a plan. I didn't have a plan. Did you have a conversation with Todd uh, regarding the custody issues you were having with Luca? There was no custody issue at the time. We were doing mediation. Did you have a uh, conversation with him regarding the, the money from uh, Michael's estate? Um, I know I was going through, I don't remember a conversation with him, but I know I was going through it at the time, the process. Um, so I don't know if you heard anything or... Mm. But why would I talk to someone I barely even know about such important things? Did you have a conversation with him about the map and how it No, because I didn't know about the map until you showed me. <sighs> this is a guy that went to jail for attempted murder. Yep. Yeah. And you're believing him. Um, what, what can you tell me about that text message? Well, since just recently I've been thinking about it, mm. since I found his phone again, mm. I was thinking, I remember you questioning me, did I write that, did I type it? Mm. And it's been back in my brain, and I was thinking, how do I prove this? Mm. So I went over how I type and how he types. Yep. He spelled Luca's name wrong, and there's no full stops or comments. Mm. <clears throat> Did you help Glenn plan to go to Melbourne? No. And kill Michael? No. Are you sure? I do not plan to kill anyone. Initially, after this interview, once again, police could not arrest or charge Bianca with any crime. That was until June of 2019, when finally, police felt like they had enough to arrest and charge Bianca for the death of Michael, claiming that she either assisted, encouraged, or directly arranged the murder of Michael. After her arrest by June of 2022, the first trial for Bianca's involvement in Michael's murder started. In the trial, the prosecution argued that Bianca was the one who set up the whole plot to have her ex-husband, Michael, killed because he was trying to see more of their son, which infuriated her. The plan was for her to have Glenn do it while she had a rock-solid alibi. She actually wanted Glenn to get caught and go to jail because she was so tired of Glenn and no longer wanted him around but it was never her intention to get Glenn killed. She just wanted him to get arrested, to wash her hands of the whole thing, and for that to be it. They talked about how they believed it was Bianca who sent that text to herself from Glenn's phone. As I stated earlier, the way it was written, plus the fact that the text from Glenn's phone as well as the response from Bianca's phone were both from their home according to location data, that shows that Bianca most likely wrote it. They said that this was clearly an attempt from Bianca to hide her own involvement. They also brought up the fact that she took that trip to Darwin a week before the murder so that she could create an alibi if the murder took place that week like it was supposed to. Then, of course, they talked about the recorded phone calls between Glenn and Bianca, where they talked about work that needed to be done. Of course, the job and work they were referring to is the murder plot. They also showed the map that Bianca had allegedly drawn for Glenn. On the other hand, Bianca denied having any involvement, saying that she did not want Michael killed. She said that the custody issues between the two weren't that big of a deal to her and that it was actually Glenn who was more upset over Michael wanting to see Luca. However, there were a few witnesses who came forward at her trial to say that they knew Bianca wanted Michael dead and she even confessed to a few people that she planned his murder. 
Glenn's mother testified saying that she overheard Bianca saying, quote, I wish I could get someone to kill him. I want someone to shoot him. I wish I could find someone to kill him. I suppose that would be illegal. Then the day after Glenn and Michael's deaths, Bianca had called her mother apparently hysterical and upset saying, it's all my fault. None of this should have happened. Glenn wasn't supposed to die. Then there was a former inmate who was with Bianca when she was in jail awaiting her trial. And what Bianca allegedly told this inmate is disturbing. This inmate told the courts what we heard earlier about how she would degrade Glenn for not being man enough to kill Michael, how she would withhold sex and wouldn't let him finish until he agreed to kill him. However, with the inmate, she went into more detail saying that she would make Glenn hold the gun while they were having sex and that would turn her on. There were other times where she would tie him up so he couldn't move and then she would get on top while holding the gun. While she was on him, she would say to him, tell me how much you want to kill him. Will you do it? I won't let you finish until you say yes. Very depraved and disturbing things that she used to manipulate Glenn and convince him to do this awful thing to another person. Another person who the court heard from was Todd Bookham. I want to use this as a time to mention that after Glenn's death, Bianca found herself pregnant with her third child. This time, it was a baby girl. Todd believed that he was the father of this baby, so after Bianca got arrested, he wrote to her in prison saying that he will retract his statement if she agrees to a paternity test. However, Bianca said that the baby was actually Glenn's, citing the IVF treatments that they went through to get pregnant. As far as I know, there was a paternity test ordered, but I don't think the results have been publicly announced. But if we know the whole timeline of things, she apparently lost a child after already being with Todd, so it seems to me like that child might have been Glenn's, but then she got pregnant after losing that child, and it's physically not possible for that child to be Glenn's, so in my opinion, I do probably think this child is Todd's, but we don't know that publicly. As far as I last saw, all of Bianca's children were under the care of her parents or the children's grandparents after Michael and Glenn's death. So this third child that she had is with their half-siblings. Todd would later tell the police that he was lying in the letter, saying that he never intended to redact his statement. He just wanted to trick Bianca into letting him see his little girl. He was emotional during these statements and really does believe that the little girl is his. So, after arguments from both sides, hearing all of the evidence, as well as witness testimony, the jury went off for deliberation. But, in the end, they could not reach a unanimous verdict. So this first trial ended in a mistrial. So in August of that same year, the next trial started, but once again, it ended in a mistrial. This time, it wasn't because of the jury, but because of arguments that were brought up in trial that weren't supposed to be mentioned. However, finally, by December of 2022, the case went to trial again. Again, pretty much everything that we've discussed up to this point was included in that trial. And this time, the jury did reach a verdict for the charges of premeditated murder, as well as for encouraging her partner to carry out the murder, she was found guilty. When it came time for sentencing, of course, so, so many people spoke up about just how badly this crime has impacted them. The families of both Michael and Glenn, as well as even Bianca's own family, were all devastated at how this took place. None of this should have happened, and it was because of Bianca's actions that two men ended up dead. When determining the sentence, the judge put a large emphasis on just how long this had been planned and calculated. This took a significant amount of premeditation. Some say that she planned to get Michael out of her life before she even met Glenn, and then when she met Glenn, she realized how easily he could have been manipulated, so she groomed him to do this over the course of years. Some say that this was decided only a few months before it took place and that Michael just happened to go along with it. But regardless of when, Bianca still put so much time and effort into this plan, taking the time to manipulate Glenn, draw out maps, set up an alibi, and send herself texts and all of that. Also, she could get Glenn to do her dirty work and get Michael out of her life. And 
In doing so, she took away both parents from her son, Luca, took away a mother from her three children and another father from his two daughters. In the end, the judge decided that a sentence of 26 years behind bars with a minimum of 20 years served before she will be eligible for parole. So that is where the case ends. Bianca will be in jail for a very, very long time for her role in the senseless deaths of these two men. I genuinely hope that Bianca never gets out because I truly believe that she deserves to be behind bars for the rest of her life. I do think she worked for months, if not years, to manipulate Glenn into this. And yes, Glenn absolutely does have his own accountability in this. He didn't have to do it. He could have said no. But just hearing how she spoke with him, how desperate he was for her approval, it just makes me sad because I do think that Bianca chose to date him because she knew he could be easily manipulated. Again, Glenn is responsible for his own role in this, but at the end of the day, none of this would have happened if it weren't for Bianca, and I truly, truly believe that. My heart absolutely goes out to Bianca's three children, as well as the families of Glenn and Michael, as well as Silvana, who was brutally beaten and harmed for absolutely no reason. None of this should have happened, and I'm glad there was justice served in this case. But that is where I'm going to end today's video, and now I want to know what you all think. Do you think Bianca is responsible for all of this? Do you think that Glenn was manipulated into this? Or do you think he wanted to do this? What do you think of the phone calls and testimony we heard about the relationship between Glenn and Bianca? Do you agree with Bianca being charged with murder? Or do you think that she wasn't as complicit because she wasn't technically there? Let's discuss this and any other thoughts that you have in the comments below. If you like this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn that notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you follow my Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and Spotify. All will be linked down below. And if you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form, which is also listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.